Let me start the recording. Got it. Okay, good. And um, what I want to point out in e-learning for our class for chapter two, um, there is a, let me put it in uh, student mode so it looks like you see it. Okay, good. So when you're looking at chapter two, you will see um, these slides here. I'm going to be uh, supplementing some of the material from the uh, Becker material. I'll supplement some of that with these slides. So you may want to get those open and, and available. Uh, so you have those to look at as we uh, go through. And of course, I'll put them up on the screen as well. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at chapter two. And uh, let me put my machine in tablet mode. Okay, good, no problems there. And um, let me go to full screen. Okay, good. And um, let's just go ahead and take a look at the table contents and get a sense of some, to some potential point value. Uh, we're gonna start quality control for a CPA firm, um, pretty light, that's two points. Let me not put that on the red there on the orange. That's two points. Um, documentation is going to be two points. So a couple of fairly light areas. Um, terms of the engagement and really uh, it's the engagement letter is another you know two to three point area. So some fairly light areas here as we begin. Uh, planning, and we're going to talk about some just very basic planning concepts. That's about two to three points. Okay. Using the work of others, um, we'll talk about internal auditors and whatnot. Uh, another fairly light area, two to three points. Okay. Now, next time um, when we finish up chapter two, we will spend, um, you know, have some heavier point areas for chapter two. We'll have about five points for the concept of materiality. Risk assessment, this is really just one big area uh, that they have uh, combined into two or separated into two sections, but it's one area, is a 10 point area. That is a key part of being successful in the auditing exam is understanding the risk assessment process not only as it pertains directly to the subject of risk assessment, but then how it affects other parts of the audit and therefore other parts uh, of the auditing exam for us. And then three points uh, you can see here for the effect of information technology on an audit, okay? All right, good. So let's just go ahead with all that and um, take a look at our first subject. Oh. Before we get into um, the discussion of quality control, uh, remember it is worthwhile knowing where you are on an audit. For example, we'll see one question of our class questions today. They'll say, which of the following should be done in planning? And the answer is going to be preliminary assessments of different uh, risks and decisions such as materiality that we're going to be making. So it's the word what? during planning and the word preliminarily, um, you know, helps you to identify what is the right answer, okay? So we're really going to, we've already done this in chapter one, and then we kind of went to the end of the process, the reporting in chapter one. Now we're coming back up to the top and we're gonna to start to cover some of these areas here today in chapter two, and we'll continue on uh, with that pattern, obviously, as we go through. Um, the rest of the chapters will really be going in order of how you would do procedures in an audit. Okay. Okay, but let's start out uh, talking about uh, quality control. Now, what we're looking at is how a CPA firm will ensure that it conducts its audits in accordance with standard. So as you recall from our first chapter, if we're doing an audit of a public entity, we have to follow public company accounting oversight board rules. If we're doing a non-public company, we follow the ICPA's um, auditing standards board requirements. 
But the AICPA has also given us a code of professional conduct. And in that code of professional conduct, they have provided us with statements of standards on quality control that tell us how we should structure the firm to make sure that our audits follow standards. So we've got standards to uh, help us follow standards, okay? And that's really what we're going to be talking about here. Now, as you know, I'm not a huge fan of mnemonics, but I do like a mnemonic that is easy to remember uh, when it's kind of, you know, has just basically a phrase or one word. And the mnemonic here is help me, okay? So just think about it. help me comply with standard through my quality control. And you can see the elements there of that mnemonic. And I want you to flashcard that, our human resources, engagement, uh, acceptance, leadership responsibilities, performance of the engagement, monitoring, and ethical requirements are the elements of quality control. And so just go ahead and make a flashcard of those elements. Now, you take a look and we start with human resources. And what happens here is we want to recruit and hire those that have the proper technical competence, but also embody the values of our uh, CPA firm. So those hired possess the appropriate characteristics to enable them to perform competently. You come over and you take a look at the next page and the approach that I'm going to take here for the quality control standards is ask you to flashcard the examples of activities that we would do that would help us to achieve the objective of the particular area, starting here with human resources, because the questions tend to say, well, which of the following would be something that would be um, done in, in to make sure the firm complies with the auditing standards. So we would require timely identification of staffing. We don't try to staff the engagement the night before. Planning for the total personnel needs of the firm. Are we taking in more clients? We're gonna need additional staff. Requiring a background check on new personnel. And if you've been hired by a CPA firm, you've probably already gone through uh, something like that. Requiring supervisor to prepare performance evaluations. Requiring personnel to attend training continuation and continuity and periodic rotation of personnel. That periodic rotation of personnel is pretty important because if you keep assigning the same individuals to the same engagements year after year, they start to lose their objectivity through no fault of their own. It's just human nature. It's uh, I would equate it to you drive home and you put get into your drive into your driveway and you like okay, how did I get here? I wasn't even paying attention to what I was doing as I was driving because I know this road so well. Well, that can start to happen where um, an auditor can lose their objectivity uh, regarding um, the engagement if they just are on that engagement year after year and then on the job training. Okay, so flashcard those particular steps under the human resources, that element of our quality control. Okay, the E in help me, engagement, acceptance, and clients can client continuance. Okay, so engagement, client acceptance, and continuance. This is important, guys. Can you think of a big CPA firm that was brought down by a bad client? Okay, I think we huh arthur anderson and enron right that whole story i mean the bad client brought down a giant uh cpa firm right and so this is a big deal okay so we want to minimize the chance that we will be involved with a lot a client whose management lacks integrity okay also, though, we should only undertake those assignments that we can reasonably expect to complete competently. Um, and this one sometimes gets a little harder because you want to get this client. Maybe it's going to be a good fee and whatnot. And it gets harder. You maybe start lying to yourself about, oh, yeah, we can complete this. Well, look, the profession has no sense of humor. State boards of accountancy have no sense of humor for a CPA that takes off an airplane and then can't land it, 
Okay, so they want you to be able to complete that engagement. They don't not going to be sympathetic. Oh, gee, did you get in over your head? No, that's not uh, that's not okay. Okay, so that means that we must be able to perform the engagement within appropriate deadlines, and we need to be worried about maintaining our independence. So we have to uh, make sure that we are clear of conflicts of interest, etc. Coming over. Again, our approach here is going to be to flashcard the examples of how you achieve the engagement acceptance, the elements of each one of these um, elements of quality control. And so reviewing the financial statement and credit rating of a proposed client. Hey, you know, we're not going to want to get involved with a client who's having credit problems, you know, bad credit rating. That might cause them to want to engage in some sort of financial reporting fraud, and we don't want to get hooked up into that, right? Inquiring of third parties as to the reputation proposed client. Again, evaluating the firm's ability to properly service the client, and then we have to reevaluate clients for a continuance. So just because you accepted them this year doesn't mean that they would be a client that you want to continue with um, in the future. And of course, you'll have infinitely more information if you've already been involved with them to make that decision going forward. Okay. Okay, good. Leadership responsibility. And look, it's not like you're going to walk into a firm on your first day, you finish here at Golden Gate, you got your CPA exams done, you get your new you know, suit, you show up to work, and they're going to say, guess what? You're in charge of the quality control system. No, okay, this is what? This is going to be a partner level um, uh, responsibility, okay? So it's those that have leadership, partner level responsibility. Okay. Okay, good. Performance. Now we're going to want to see what kind of steps we'll take to make sure that our audits are following the appropriate standards. Okay, so we're going to look at policies and procedures that will help us achieve a consistently high level of performance. Okay, so let's just go ahead and go over to the examples of things that uh, we could do to make sure that our um, engagements follow the appropriate standards okay you can see here that we designate individuals with expertise in matters related to say the sec or a particular industry right referring questions to the appropriate great group in the icpa or state society hardy har 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 go ahead try and get them on the phone these days to talk to you about anything okay they kind of you know Put the thing on autopilot, okay? But uh, flashcard it anyway. Developing standard audit forms, checklists, and questionnaires that will help to uh, achieve consistency, right? Because each engagement will have a certain format forms that we'll use for different procedures. Establishing procedures for reviewing engagement docu documents and using passwords or other means of restricting access to engagement documents. Um, you know, establishing procedures for reviewing and engagement documents, not only from a supervisory standpoint, but also um, having someone probably that is unrelated to that engagement be able to go through and review the work before the um, product is issued, uh, and the audit report is issued, and we're going to see uh, that that's actually a requirement for public companies, and we'll take a look at that here in a couple of minutes, okay? Okay, good. Then we have monitoring. Okay, so we want policies and procedures to ensure that our quality control system is working. And the key thing there is to have a, um, well, just let me point out again, this is a partner level responsibility for monitoring. But the key thing that you do to monitor is a peer review. Okay, and we're going to talk more about peer review here in a couple seconds. But what uh, peer review is, is we have a CPA firm of similar size and status come and look at our quality control system to see that we have the elements of help me that we've been talking about. So if it's a big four firm, the peer review will probably be done by another big four firm. If it's a national firm, then it's going to be another uh, similar firm, small firm going to be a smaller firm. Now, in the state of California, 
you have to be registered with the state society to be able to do peer reviews. And in order for the state society to approve you to do peer review, you have to have been registered with the AICPA's peer review group. So that's the recognized peer review group in the state of California. And I have a feeling that that is the case probably in all 50 states that the AICPA's peer review uh, group is the one that uh, most uh, states require that you register with in order to be able to do the peer review. Now, we will also have a wrap up or second partner review. And that mean, that's required for public companies under Sarbanes-Oxley. So before we can issue the report, we have to have this second partner review. And that again is something that will help to ensure that we are meeting the standards on our engagements. So go ahead and flashcard that uh, there has to be that wrap up or second partner pre-issuance before we issue the report pre-issuance review. Okay, Okay. good. Now they said they were going to tell us more about peer review. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the peer review. And again, the purpose of the peer review, and sometimes I think um, when you're first hearing about peer review, you think, oh, okay, they're just going to look at my audit work papers to see if my audits follow standard. That is part of what they'll do, but they're really looking to see that the firm has in place the overall quality control system that we're talking about here uh, today. So that's really the purpose of the peer review. And uh, peer review occurs when one CPA firm reviews another. A CPA firm that is a member of the AICPA must have a peer review every three years in order to maintain membership in the AICPA. Now you look at that and you think, okay, well, just don't become a member of the AICPA and you don't have to have a peer review. Wonderful. No, the state laws require the peer review. And so if you're going to be a CPA firm and conduct audits, uh, in fact, you don't even have to be a firm. Um, you know, an individual CPA, when I renew my license, I have to indicate that it is not necessary for me to have a peer review because I'm not doing uh, audits. But if you're doing assurance work, then even as a sole proprietor, you would have to uh, have a peer review done of your work. Okay. Um, the firm being reviewed can select or may ask the AICPA or state society to select. Again, they have to be properly registered, though. You just can't say, oh, yeah, yeah, Joe Blow, CPA firm over here is going to do my peer review. They would have to have already been registered to do such in order for you to select them. And then upon completion of the uh, peer review, they issue a report. And I think you can have a pass. You can have a pass with issues or something like that, which is like a qualified opinion. Okay, and then you can have a fail and a fail, of course, would be a disaster for you because they probably suspend your ability to conduct uh, audits at that point in time. Different levels, not necessary for the exam for you to know the different types of outcomes of peer review, but do flashcard um, these points about it. Okay, okay, good. Come over and let's look at ethical requirements. Okay, and the big thing here when you look is independence, okay? So we need to be independent. So independence requirements should be communicated to firm personnel. Not only do you need to make sure that you're independent, but you need to be forward looking at threats to independence. Um, they say at least annually confirm with staff that they are independent on their engagements. Uh, when I was working with the Government Accountability Office with GAO, Every time I turned in my time card every other week, I had to check off that I don't have any impairments to my independence on that engagement. So, you know, it was done every two weeks in that case, right? And then, um, you know, we want to rotate personnel uh, probably to make sure that we maintain that independence. So let's look at some examples of things that we will do to help maintain our independence and we'll maintain records showing whether or not we have clients that have relatives holding key position, notify personnel of who our publicly held clients are. So if they had a stock or some, you know, sort of investment, 
they would be able to uh, notify us of that so we can make sure not assign them to those engagements. Confirming with staff that prohibited relationships do not exist. Like I said, we do that. Because I'm still, uh, GAO will always be we to me, okay? But um, I don't work there anymore. And then emphasizing independence of mental attitude in training and supervision. So just flashcard those types of things, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and um, you take a look and the reason they have hit this here is that we'll see a question that will compare the objective of the quality control standards versus generally accepted auditing standards. And the quality control standards are there to make sure that we follow GAS. So GAS tells us how to conduct the audit. The quality control standards tell us what? tell us how to structure our CPA firm so that we will follow the standards. So go ahead and flashcard that point. Okay, any question? All right, good. I think that's enough of that. We looked at the elements. We don't need to go through every single um, issue here. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at our first class question today. Trying to put the poll up. It's going to be one of those nights where my cursor is going to uh, play a little hide and seek with me. I see. Yeah. Really? Are you really going to start this? Okay. Hopefully, it'll stop doing that. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and uh, take your best shot on this one. And um, you can see here that um, most of us got the answer correct, which is choice C. Uh, we're about at 60%. Uh, percent. Let me share the results here. Okay, so um, the answer is C, but let's go ahead and just take a look. And uh, let me close the poll. And um, okay, so which of the following is an element of the CPA firm's quality control? And you would want to, of course, remember what? Help me, right? Okay, and then C, to what extent one of these um, falls under something that could be an element of help me? So complying with laws and regulations? No, there was nothing that was... Uh, 
an element of help me that would be part of the quality control using statistical sampling techniques. That's not even required by gas. I mean, generally accepted auditing standards doesn't say you need to use statistical sampling. They say you can use sampling, but it doesn't have to be statistical sampling. Consider audit risk and materiality. Sure, you do need to consider audit risk and materiality, but that is not part of the quality control standards. Assigning personnel to engagement, yep, that fits right under the human resources element, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at the second question. Okay, I'll give you a little more time on this one. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Okay, and um, okay, good. Most of us got it right. Again, the answer is C, okay, but um, let's take a look. Sorry, guys, my cursor is just not behaving itself today. Okay, and so let's take a look which of the following is not true about the relationship between the quality control standards and professional standards such as gas. Okay, and the correct answer is C, a firm's failure to establish or comply with the appropriate system of quality control implies that the firm has also followed to um, follow professional standards on individual engagements, not necessarily but you're driving drunk. You're asking for trouble if you don't have the quality control system, but it doesn't mean because you um, don't have it that your audits are not going to follow standard. Now, probably the better way to answer this since it's a not true is look and see, well, why are A, B, and C, uh, A, B, and D true? Quality control standards to the conduct of the firm's entire practice, whereas professional standards such as gas relate to the conduct of individual engagements. I just had you flashcard that. That's right out of the book. The adoption of quality control standards increase the likelihood of compliance. Yeah, that's the whole point. A firm that has not adopted an appropriate system of quality control may still be in compliance with professional standards with respect to individual engagements. Yeah, okay. Um, that can happen. Thus, the reason A is not true. It does not necessarily mean that the firm's engagements are not following standard, but you're asking for trouble if you don't set up the quality control system. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at our second module, which is going to be audit documentation. And let's take a look at one of the requirements for audit documentation, basically our work papers. And our work papers are to show that the accounting records reconcile 
uh, with the financial statements. Flashcard that, okay? And uh, what firms do is they have at, near the front of the work papers or you know near the beginning of the work papers, what they'll have is something called a lead schedule. And that lead schedule will basically be the financial statement line items. And then there'll be a work paper reference as to where you can look to get the information to see what sort of audit procedures and whatnot were done for those various line items. That helps to show the reconciliation between what we have in the accounting records to uh, the financial statements. Okay, so that's a requirement that you have to have that. Also, they should be in enough detail to enable someone who has no uh, previous um, experience with that engagement to understand the decisions that were made by the team and whatnot. Um, I remember one time I had done some work and I didn't do too good of a job of documenting what I did. And so they asked me, well, what happened here? And when I explained it to them, they go, well, that's a great explanation. Thank you for doing such a thorough job on that, but uh, you can't staple yourself to your work paper. So go back and make sure that you have, you know, documented all those things that you talked about. So you need to be able to do that. You may understand what you did, but it has to be that somebody else can come behind and uh, review and follow that work, right? And of well, course- we Audit documentation was always the worst as a new staff. It was always worse for, for new staff? Oh yeah, just hard. Like... Yeah, you know, because you're under a time crunch probably and you yeah. do the procedure and you're like, okay, there, I got it, you know, and then you yeah. just want to move on. Meanwhile, you know, you forgot that you need to document what you what did for somebody else to know what you did. Yeah, I was, as you might, they used to say, I don't understand, John, because, um, you know, you are very clear of explaining everything you've done. And then when we look at your work papers, it looks like a kid did it, you know, because <laughs> your writing is so <laughs> sloppy and everything. Can you imagine somebody said my writing was sloppy? <laughs> and so um, thank God for you know word and excel and those kind of things now makes things a lot easier to to you know make things look neat okay good now you come over and uh you take a look at um, document uh, retention and it is different for public companies versus non-public and the uh, deal is that it is longer for um, public companies so you've got five years that you have to retain documentation for report release date for non-public companies. For public companies, it's seven years. And just flashcard that. That's one of those annoying things that they might ask you on the exam. Um, meanwhile, if you weren't sure, you would just look that up, okay, at some point in time. But uh, the examiners like to ask questions like that. They also like to ask about how much time do you have to complete your documentation? And they give you 60 days for non-public companies and for public companies, it's only 45 days. Now, sometimes people will say, well, wait a minute, I've made changes to work papers, you know, beyond these time frames, okay, which you should flashcard. That's true. You can do that, but if you make a change after these dates, you have to leave what was originally in there and then explain why you had to make a change. So you can still make a change beyond these dates, but with it, within these uh, time frames. but um, you know, after these time frames, you have to leave the original stuff in there and then just document what it was that you wanted to change. Okay? All right, good. Come over. And we have a couple of different levels of files. We have permanent files. And as you might imagine, permanent files go on from year to year. And it's things like bylaws, articles of incorporation. Okay, you don't want to go to your client every year and say, can I see them bylaws again? Keep that in a permanent file, right? And then current file relate to the current year under audit. So the current year's audit plan, the current year's financial statements, et cetera. Okay, okay good. Let's go ahead and take a look at this next annoying thing. Okay. I have a question about the current year versus the permanent year. 
um, do subsequent events, things that may be going from one year to the next year or may have multi-year um, implications go in the permanent file or the current file? Because there's questions in the work papers of, in the in the Becker stuff about what goes in the permanent file, what goes in the current file, you know, that kind of stuff. I'd be careful with questions like that. That sounds like they gave somebody an assignment to write some questions about permanent file versus current file and they went ahead and did it. So I'd look at those questions um, with a little bit of skepticism, okay? But having said that, um, you know, I'm thinking from the way you described that, that that would be a current file thing. Now it could appear, say in, two different years, you know, but that doesn't mean it goes into the permanent file because I wouldn't think that a subsequent event would just go on year after year after year after year. Eventually it's going to resolve itself, right? Yeah. So I would, I would label that more current file uh, item, although it may appear in the current file of two, you know, more than one year. Um, what did you see? Did you see something else? You know, I don't remember it now, but there was one I got wrong where they said, oh, well, this kind of stuff's always in the permanent file. And I was like, really? You know, and so I just, I have to go back and look at the question, but, uh, and it's just one question. So, you know. Let me, but, let me just give you a little bit of a picture of the beast here for a second. You know, the, the peek behind the curtain, okay. Um, you know, Becker knows that they have to write some questions. And they might turn to someone like me. They don't because I don't like to do this. But they could turn to someone like me and say, hey, John, can you write us up a bunch of questions about the permanent and the current file? And then what happens is I say, sure, yeah, I'd love to do that. When do you need it? Uh, we need it by, you know, the end of the month. And so then, you know, the person starts working on it, you know, um, June 29th. Okay, and they sit there and they, you know, use all their creative juices to come up with a bunch of questions that, you know, may not be representative. So when you see something like that, and you're like, really, am I going to see 52 questions on the CPA exam about permanent versus current file? You might get one. I'm not even asking you to flashcard this notice. Okay. Yeah, this was one of the task-based simulations, and it was one of the choices, and I kind of went, eh. <laughs> Now, what was a task-based simulation, which I find extremely annoying, and that might be why they have something like that, was the tick marks. Okay? <laughs> God, that drove me nuts. <laughs> and that is crazy, because there are no standardized tick marks. The ICPA Auditing Standards Board doesn't come down and say, hey, make your tick marks, you know, and here they are, and this is what you got to use, okay? But flashcard it, because unfortunately, I guess there was a CPA exam question that expected you to interpret tick marks. Look, if I put this on my work papers at the GAO, they'd say, they'd call in and say they found the Zodiac killer. Right? You know, I don't know what that means okay but i mean i can see agreed that's not a tick i ever put on a work paper okay so anyway um you know what are you gonna do we're gotta deal with the examiners and if they ask something stupid like that uh, at least you've looked at a flash card um you know prior to your exam that uh, calls that stuff out and you could literally when i say flash card it you could just copy that out of your book and then make it into a flash card Okay, question? All right, good. Let's go ahead then and look at our next class question.
Yeah, it was the uh, board of director minutes um, that they thought always should go in the permanent file. And I thought that should go in the current file because it was board of director minutes for this year and this year's audit. That was the one I was confused about. Yeah, I agree with you. But they you said, oh, the board of director question. minutes has stuff that, that pertains to multiple years. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know. Those permanent files are going to start getting heavy if you got to sit there and put, let's what, quarterly boards of directors meet? So you, if you're doing an audit for 10 years, you mean to tell me you're going to have 40 volumes of board of directors minutes in the permanent file? Um, so again, I could see having board of director minutes from a previous year in the current year. I don't understand why that would go into the permanent file, you know, unless it had something to deal with something that was going to be, you know, the, the particular um, thing that was talked about in the board meeting. If it has something that's, you know, changing the, you know, charter of the company or something, then I would, uh, you know, the, the bylaws or something, then I would say, yeah, put that in right. the uh, permanent file. But, you know, there could be things that would be talked about in a board meeting, such as maybe, I think I gave the example the other day, uh, there was a discussion I saw in board minutes about the lawsuit. Um, you know, well, that would be relevant to that year, maybe the next, maybe the third, but, you know, you don't have to put in the permanent file so that it's there even after the lawsuit is is uh, settled and stuff. So I don't know, I don't agree with that. You can send me that question and I'll, I'll, uh, I can ask about that. Yeah, it was the first task, it was part one of the first task-based simulation and it was uh, number nine. Chapter uh, two's task-based Chapter based two, simulation? yeah. Okay. I'll it was, T it was TBS 012007. <laughs> zero one two seven. Zero one two zero oh, zero oh, seven. Okay, um, and it's permanent versus. Yeah, and I think I I think I had to watch the video to <laughs> to learn that. I was well, like, really? Did he, <laughs> did he say board minutes would be in the permanent file? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's what the correct answer is because I went really. Oh, they have a video that explains it. Yeah, I think they do. Yeah, because because it wasn't they just basically gave the right answers in the question. And I was like, <laughs> well, it says minutes of meeting. It's here, you know, I don't, maybe I stand corrected. I, I just don't understand that minutes of what meetings. Well, and also, if you read the minutes of the meeting, it's all about this particular year's audit. So it's kind of like yeah. I didn't think that was. Anyway, I don't want to take up too much. This is a trivial yeah. point. I don't want to take up too much. No, that's fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask about that because that's that seems a little funny. But okay, good. Let's go ahead and um, take a look at this one. And looks like you know everybody got this one right. Uh, we sort of had mentioned that as a flashcard, or uh, did I mention as a flashcard? I can't remember now. But we had saw seen that in the book that the accounting records uh, need to reconcile to the financial statements. Now, um, I think pointing out choice D, even though I don't think anybody picked it, uh, be careful because this is something that the exam likes to try to trick you into is the mm. thinking that your work papers support the financial statements. No, the accounting system supports the financial statements and then the auditor looks at evidence that supports the opinion, right? So. Um, just keep that in the back of your mind because there are questions that are worded in a way to try to mess you up on that point. Okay. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and talk about those charged with governance. Okay. And I always kind of say, geez, you know, this sounds highfalutin, those charged with governance. Okay. But um, basically, what they're talking about is the board of directors and the audit committee, but they just don't want to call it audit committee. They just don't want to call it 
board of directors because different entities have different governance structure. If I'm auditing, say, a housing authority, I think they call it board of commissioners or something like that. Okay. But know that under Sarbanes Oxley, they tell us, hey, look, the audit committee is the one that hires and fires the auditors. They're overseeing the engagement. That was something that came out of Sarbanes because there was concern that management was having too big of a hand in selecting the auditors. And then the auditors felt beholden to management and there was really no appeal level if there started to be disagreements between management and the auditors. So now those kinds of disagreements and whatnot go to who hired you, which would be uh, the board of directors, those charged with governance, the audit committee. Um, and then it is worth noting that we would like to have the um, auditor uh, appointed, you know, before the year end, of course, okay, probably at the start of the year, right, is when we would want the client, um, would want the auditor to be appointed. But if for some reason we weren't able to um, hire the auditor at the start of the year, let's say, then there are alternative procedures that we could perform that would still allow us to issue, say, an unqualified opinion. For example, if I couldn't observe inventory, I think I gave the example in here, I might be able to observe inventory, whatever date I finally come on board and then work my way back to see what the uh, beginning inventory was. But if we can't accomplish that, then what they're telling us here, and I want you to flashcard, is that you would need to discuss the implications of the late hire in terms of, well, is that gonna create a situation with a qualified or um, a disclaimer of opinion? Okay, okay, good. Question. Come over. Uh -huh. uh, can you rely on the, uh, if, if the statements were audited by a predecessor auditor, can you rely on their inventory observation since if they issued an, an unqualified opinion and they did observe inventory? When you say observe inventory, you mean at December 31st and they had an, and they. Yeah, and, and maybe yeah. you picked up this client in September or something like that. Like Yes. Maybe. Yes, you can. However, you have to make certain inquiries of the predecessor. You'd have to like look at their work papers, right? And you make sure you're satisfied. Their, you have to look at their work papers. You have to make, uh, well, let me, let me jump that. You are required to make pre-acceptance questions to the predecessor before mm -hmm. you can accept the client. There's certain things you have to ask them. Then after you accept the client, then you ask the client to arrange a meeting where you can review the work papers and whatnot. Yeah, and then you can rely on the work that they did. You don't have to redo you know, previous year's uh, steps. Um, you know, if you've ever done that, uh, it's real fun. They set you up in a conference room there and they put you in the fishbowl and somebody probably sits there with you the whole time while you're going through those work papers you know, from the predecessor. But uh, yeah, that's what you got to do. Okay. Okay, good. Now looking at clients acceptance. And again, got to make sure that you can complete the engagement. Okay. The standards, the state boards of accountancy. And if you ever pick up uh, the quarterly letter of the California State Board of Accountancy, the fun thing to do is to turn straight to the back and see what the disciplinary actions that have been taken against CPAs are. And it is amazing how frequently it's they undertook an audit which they did not have the ability to complete successfully. That is an easy mistake to make, but the standard, the, the you know, state boards have no sense of humor for that. Okay, they want you to be able to, if you're going to take the plane off, you better be able to land it. Okay. Now, when we come over to this next page, okay, they talk about reasons, um, you know, that you need to consider when accepting a client, okay, or things you need to consider. And I want you to flashcard number one reason not 
to accept a client. And that is management lacks integrity. Okay, that's the number one reason not to accept a client. Now you look at that and say, well, wait a minute, John. I would have thought that independence would be the number one reason. Well, it is, but the CPA exam knows that that is too what? Uh, too easy for you. So they're not going to ask you that. Okay. But they'll say, which of the following would most likely cause a CPA, an accountant, an auditor not to accept a client? And it's amazing how often the answer is management lacks integrity. Okay. But you can put on the flashcard, this is the number one reason. This would be the number two reason. This would be the number four reason the firm lacks ability to staff the engagement. Okay, so I'm kind of changing this up a little bit. That's the word lax, L-A-C-K-S. I'm changing this up a little bit, asking to make a flashcard to say reasons not, in fact, why don't I just put that, reasons not to accept a client. Hello, I already wrote that. Okay, reasons not to accept a client. That's what you could put on the flashcard. And then on the back, on the front side of the card, say, what are the reasons not to accept a client? Number one, management lacks integrity. Number two, lack of independence. Number three, lack of uh, firms, firm lacks ability to staff the engagement, something like that. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and um, let's take a look at preconditions for an audit. And let's take a look at management imposed scope limitation. Okay. And so if management Oh, we're on the next page. If management imposes a scope limitation that we know going in are going to result in a disclaimer of an opinion, we are not allowed to accept that engagement. That's a management imposed limitation. So management says to you, we're not going to allow you to confirm account receivable. And you look and you say, well, I won't be able to have any alternative procedure if I don't confirm a receivable. So I'm going to have to disclaim an opinion on the financial statements. That kind of scope limitation imposed by management won't allow you, and it's gonna result in disclaimer, you can't even accept that engagement. That is not the same as the situation we've been talking about, you didn't observe the inventory. That's a what? That's a circumstance, not a scope in, uh, in limitation imposed by management, okay? Okay, good. So they tell me if management imposed scope limitation will result in a qualified opinion, that's okay. You can still accept the engagement. It's where we get to what, and remember, we use qualification to describe what both for gas and gap qualification. So we're obviously talking about a gas qualification there. If that's the case, then you can still accept the engagement. But if it goes all the way to disclaimer, and eh, step away from the engagement. You cannot accept that engagement. And again, that's a management imposed scope limitation. Okay. Okay, good. Let's come over and take a look. And we have to have a written engagement letter on every engagement. And we're going to talk later about um, preparation engagement. We're going to talk later about compilation engagement where there's no assurance. We're going to talk about reviews later where we have a limited negative assurance. Every engagement has to have an engagement letter. Every engagement. I don't care whether you're giving assurance or not. There must be a written agreement to make sure that there is no misinterpretation of the responsibilities of either party. Okay, so you can flashcard that. And then you can look at engagement letter contents. And at a high level, they've given us the engagement letter should talk about the scope of the audit, inherent limitations of the audit, the responsibility of the auditor, the responsibility of management. Flashcard, those high level, okay? Those are high level discussions of the kind of major sections, if you will, of the engagement letter. So I want you to flashcard that. And then the book 
meanders through and fails to do a good job to put some of the other things that are listed here um, under these broad headings. So I finally got tired of trying to make them, you know, mark up the book to show you how these things that are listed here fall under these major headings as I've asked you to flashcard. So at the start of class, guys, I showed you this um, slides that I have here, okay? So when you open that, you'll see this PowerPoint and, uh, oh, probably should have shown you this sooner. We were talking about peer reviews and the book doesn't say this, okay? But under PCAOB requirements, um, firms that audit um, more than 100 public companies have to have a peer review annually. Firms that um, audit um, less than 100 public entities have to have a peer review every three years, okay? And that's not in the book anywhere, but I had a dream that the... Um, exam asks that question okay so make sure you have that uh, flashcard okay and then um coming back to our uh manage uh, our engagement letter okay what i did was i took things from the book and i put them under management responsibility versus auditor responsibility okay so that you can see how they fit there and so talking about internal controls, um, we want to make sure they understand that they're going to have to give us a representation letter at the end of the engagement. I talked about that a little bit last time. Representation letter, you've got to get that. You cannot give an unqualified opinion if they don't give you a representation letter at the end of the engagement. So we put it in the engagement letter, which is essentially a contract between the auditor and the entity, the auditee, it's a contract. And so you put in there, you're going to give us this. So that if you get to the end of the engagement and they say, well, I'm not giving you, I'm not signing that thing. You say, well, remember this contract we had that said you would provide me this. And if you don't, I'm not issuing the opinion and you're going to pay me anyway. And then Judge Judy's going to tell them that they're going to pay you. OK, so you put that in the um, in the engagement letter that they've got to give you the representation letter at the end of the engagement. So engagement letter comes at the beginning. Representation letter comes at the end. OK, and so on, guys, you can see some of these things. I'm not going to read through every one of these. If you're wondering what these uh, letters mean, this was my weak attempt at a mnemonic. So now you see why I don't do well with mnemonics. This was a crisp porta, okay, a crisp port, I guess, a crisp port, right? You know, if you've ever had a port wine, they're not crisp, so I don't know how this um, fits at all, but whatever, okay? Just make sure you look at this, okay? Now, the other thing about the engagement letter, um, you will discuss your audit fees there. So uh, true or false audit fee should not be discussed. That's false. True or false engagement letters have to be written. We saw that in the book. So just a couple of flashcards there for you, because again, I you know pre-made ones that I made here because I feel that the book kind of um, you know meanders around a bit and doesn't do a good job organizing some of the things that it says, like you know about fees and stuff. So what I tried to do was um, organize that a little bit for you on that flashcard, okay? Now, if you are going to be, you know, auditing this client over several years, you do not have to um, redo an engagement letter um, each year. However, if the terms of the engagement are changing, then you will need to uh, do a new engagement letter, but you should at least remind the client that the previous engagement letter terms are still in place in that new year that you're conducting the audit. And that can be oral or written, but you uh, don't have to do an engagement letter if you're gonna be auditing for every single year, if there's been no change. If there's been a change, 
yeah, then you're going to have to issue a new engagement letter. But if there's nothing changes, then just remind them that the previous terms of the previous engagement letter still fall, follow. Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we have an initial audit, okay, that means that if with an initial audit, the financial statements were not audited or were audited by a predecessor. Okay, this is what we're talking about. So a predecessor means that uh, if you audited last year and I audit this year, you are the predecessor, I would be the successor. Okay, and what we're saying is there's going to have to be communication between the predecessor and the successor auditor. Okay, and it is mandatory that you make these inquiries, but client permission is needed. Now, when I was studying auditing, that used to drive me nuts. I'd be like, well, if it's mandatory, why do I have to ask the client permission? Well, you could ask the client's permission and they could say, no, we don't want you to talk to the predecessor. And then you'd say, well, why? And if they say, well, because the predecessor was a maniac, you know, we had to call security and get them out of here and we don't want you to be communicating with them. Well, that might be a legitimate reason not to do this mandatory uh, procedure. However, you really need to consider carefully the implications on your audit if the client won't let you make the re what are required pre-acceptance inquiries of the predecessor. So you're supposed to do, you really should, unless there's a strong, compelling reason not to, you know, uh, hey, we had to, well, this person is very incompetent very difficult to work with. And uh, we highly recommend you, we do not want you to communicate with them. If they tell you no, you can't do it, but you better be careful when you accept that client. Okay, okay, good. Now we have to make written or oral inquiries. You need to document that you had these inquiries. And what's interesting is when you look at this list, and this is before acceptance, this is before acceptance inquiries. But what's funny is when you look at this list, it's all about management integrity. Okay, what were disagreements with management? What were the reasons for the change of the auditor? And you're saying, well, why is that a management integrity thing? Well, maybe the predecessor is going to tell you, well, I had to get out of this engagement because these people are going have, have their serious problems with them, right? Okay. Communication to management uh, and the audit committee regarding fraud, noncompliance. Again, getting to the issue of management integrity where there are significant unusual transactions that could be indicative of fraud. So everything is really getting to what, to management's integrity here. Okay. Now you look at this next one and we talk about change in the engagement. So what happens? Let's say I'm doing the engagement and we're in the early phases of the engagement and management calls me and it says, you know, we talked to the bank and we don't actually need an audit, we need a review. Would it be okay to change from a audit to review at that point? Answer is yes. If it's early along enough in the engagement and you haven't done a lot of audit procedures, fine. If they said that to you after your, you know, the day before you're ready to issue an a qualified opinion on the financials and just say, oh, uh, well, with the review, uh, why don't you just give us a review so we don't end up with a qualified opinion? No, that is not a good enough reason to change from a, say, audit to a review, okay? So an audit may be changed from a audit to a compilation or review, but there are unacceptable reasons and let's flashcard that if the engagement would uncover fraud or errors. And look, you probably wouldn't know that until you were uh, essentially about done to finish the audit, right? So um, again, you know, something that's probably happening later on in the engagement. Um, and, you know, you've discovered that the client is trying to mislead users of financial statements. And so they sit there and say, oh, don't give us an audit, give us a review. No, that's not an acceptable reason. 
Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and um, take a look at, uh, you know, let's flashcard these couple things here. I hadn't originally planned to do that, but I, actually it's pretty good to thing the flashcard. Um, an accountant is generally precluded from issuing compilation review report when the accountant has been engaged to audit the financial statements and has been prohibited by the client uh, to correspond with the entity's legal counsel. What they're saying there is in a review, you don't have to do that step. So you can't sit there and say, well, I was doing an audit. They won't let me talk to the legal counsel. So what else do I have in my little bag of tricks here? Let's see. How about I give you a review instead of an audit? That's not OK. Or the account has been engaged to audit or review the statements, and the client does not provide us with a signed representation letter. You don't have to have a representation letter in a compilation. So you sit there and say, well, look, if you don't want to give me the representation letter, how about I just give you a compilation? No, not okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at our next question. Okay, guys, um, let's take a look at this one and um, I'll take the hit for why um, maybe we didn't do as well as I would hope we could on this one. The correct answer is C. So most of us got it right, but then I'm going to show you that I had forgotten to ask you to write something in because the book never mentioned the notion here that we are supposed to uh, take a look at the work papers of the predecessor, although Kathy and I kind of talked about that a little bit, but it wasn't called out in the book. So I'm going to show you where I want you to write it on um, the communication with the predecessor part of the book in a minute. But let's just look at this one. You should ask for the work papers. There's nothing in the standard to see the work papers. There's nothing in the standard that says you should look at the engagement letter. Now you may very well in some uh, legal, um, you know, statutorily requirements, you do ask for the engagement letter, but there is nothing in the auditing standards that say that you are to look at the engagement letter. And some folks might find that a little bit questionable because why are you having to see the contract between another audit firm and the client, oh, geez, I didn't realize that's what they charge you for fees. So I'm going to have to bump up my fees a little bit. So, you know, that's not, uh, you know, or, oh, that's what they charge. I'm going to go get some more of their clients, you know. So there could be some question about doing that. 
Uh, so that's a no. Work papers, yes. So just to make sure that we're remembering that point up here where they talk about um, that we should ask management if we can have the inquiries and then you can put also ask to arrange review of predecessors work papers and put that on the flashcard. Also ask to arrange review of predecessors work papers and put that on the flashcard. Okay. Okay, good. All right, let's go ahead then and take a look at our next question. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Um, and uh, we did pretty good on this one. 75% got uh, the correct answer, which is A. Now, um, since we know that A is the right answer, let's just go from the bottom and talk about why the wrong ones are wrong. And um, you can see here that we say, which is following included in the engagement letter, the auditor's responsibility to search D, the auditor's responsibility to search for uh, internal control deficiencies. No, we do not have responsibility to search for control deficiencies. We have an understanding to, we have a requirement to obtain an understanding of the control and use that to determine the time and extent and nature of our further audit procedures, but we don't search for weaknesses, okay? Now, if in doing that work, we encounter weaknesses, then yeah, we may need to do some additional work, but we have no responsibility uh, to search for internal control deficiencies, okay? Managements were caught vicarious liability for violations and laws and regulations committed by employees. Look, management may have a vicarious liability if their employees do something that damages something the company may be uh responsible uh for that but that's not you know putting you're not going to put that in an engagement letter i mean that's kind of would be a weird thing to put in there right uh factors to be considered in setting preliminary judgments about materiality i mean you might have a conversation with them, but you're not gonna put that in the engagement letter. I mean, that's kind of like going on a first date and asking somebody how many kids they want. You know, That's too detailed for the very beginning of the engagement, right? And then A, 
The correct answer, yes, management responsibility for the fair presentation of financial statements. We're making sure that they understand they are responsible and we're putting that in the engagement letter. Okay. All right, good. So let's go ahead and let's take our break now as we enter our next module. So I'm showing a little, what, about 620. So let's just go ahead and we'll reconvene about 630, okay? I'm gonna pause the recording. Please somebody remind me to start it up again when I come back. Resume the recording and um, start back. Um, quick question, does anyone know when they'll be releasing scores for folks that took the exam in January? The 8th, at least if you took it before the 23rd, I think. If you took it before the 23rd, you'll get your scores on February 8th, you're saying? Yep. So Monday? Yep. Or I guess that's Monday. Or Sunday, whatever. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Well, wait, the 8th is Tuesday. So. Okay. Yeah. okay. I was looking at. Uh, they always make us wait at least a month. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends. I. I have had some students that strategize when they're going to take it so that they take it as close as possible to the release <laughs> to when they're going to release the scores because they can't stand the suspense. But anyway, that's kind of a weird way to strategize when you're going to take it. But OK, good. I'll keep that in mind and um, that that's coming up next week. OK, good. Um, let's take a look here at module four and I just want to jump to supervision okay let's just jump jump to supervision we're talking about you know very beginning of the engagement here and um, the point of super uh, proper supervision now when you think about supervision um, what we're talking about is the partner supervising everyone else on the engagement OK, I think that we tend to think a supervisor as, you know, just our immediate senior above us or something. But no, they're talking about the partner and the CPA exam is treating you CPA candidate as the partner. So sometimes I'll get students to say, well, that's not a decision that I make. The partner makes that decision. Well, they're asking you as the partner, what decision would you be making here? OK, so you need to kind of put yourself in that seat. And what the partner is to do is direct the efforts of the assistants, which is everybody else on the engagement other than the partner is seen as an assistant, communicating with the audit team, informing assistants of their ability, staying informed, reviewing the work performed by assistants. Okay, um, nature extent and timing of the super of supervision will depend on the size and complexity of the entity, the nature of the work assigned, any assessed risks, and the, the more, the higher the assessed risk, the more the supervision, right? And the qualifications of the assistants, right? If you've got somebody, your partner, and it's the first time someone's been a manager on an audit, you're probably going to supervise them more than if it was, you know, someone who's got a few audits uh, under their belt. OK, so pretty, you know, basic stuff, guys. I'm not even asking you to flashcard that. Um, the only reason I'm highlighting this is I want to make sure that um, you understand that if you have some sort of disagreement and you feel you need to document that in the work papers, that is when you are quitting and leaving the firm and you're saying, hey, I'm leaving the firm because I have some disagreements in the way we're conducting this audit. And I would like to document that disagreement. It's not, hey, you know, they said that we would go to lunch at 1130 and I don't think we should go till 12. That's not the kind of thing you're talking about, uh, disagreement to document, okay? Okay, good. Now, we have to have a knowledge of the client's business and industry. Okay, I'm not going to say anything more about that. I find that very self-explanatory, understanding the client's business by touring the facility, 
reviewing their financial history, um, obtaining an understanding of their accounting, inquiring of client personnel. Okay, I'm not saying much about these things, guys, because it's just so self-explanatory what touring the facility means, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and uh, developing the audit strategy and just take a look down here. Uh, developing the audit strategy early in the audit helps the auditor determine the resources needed to complete the engagement. And you can see some of those things like budgeting hours and whatnot, and then come down and we should make preliminary evaluations of materiality, audit risk, and internal control. Now, this is what I was talking about and that knowing where you are in the engagement, um, we would know and it would say which of the following would the auditor most likely do during the planning phase. And you know, if it's a preliminary evaluation of materiality, audit risk, and uh, internal control, then that's obviously something that's done during the planning because it's a preliminary assessment, right? Okay, the flashcard there, can you do see I just did you on that. Then you come over and developing the audit plan. Okay, just let's take a look at that. And we have to have what? We have to have a written audit plan. And uh, I already had you a flashcard on that. Okay, but there it is in a pass key now. Okay, now they talk about parts of the audit plan here, which is okay. You know, these are parts of the audit plan, but I don't want you to sit here and look at this and think, oh, okay, this is just some sections to a document that I need to know about. What these are, are literally laying out the steps that an auditor goes through when they're making certain decisions about the engagement. So these are steps. And then of course you document those steps in the audit plan. So come over and we say that the audit procedures are performed to obtain evidence which to base the opinion and audit procedures may be categorized as either one, risk assessment procedures, and that's step one. So we'll just do it like this. And they shouldn't say or. It's and. Step two, further audit procedures. I guess they're saying they may be categorized as, I see why they're saying or, but it's two steps. Okay, step one and step two. I see why they're saying or that they're saying they're going to fall in either one of these categories, but you're going to do both steps, okay? Now, when you come over and you take a look at the step one, risk assessment procedures, I want you to write the word always. You must always do risk assessment procedures. You always have to do risk assessment procedures, okay? And they tell us that risk assessment procedures are used to obtain an understanding of the entity and its environment, including its internal control in order to assess, key phrase, the risk of material misstatement, okay? So on every engagement, you have to obtain an understanding of the entity, including its internal control, to assess the risk of material misstatement, which you will see abbreviated all over the textbook here, RMM, okay? And that is then used to determine the timing, extent, and nature of further audit procedures. So what they're saying here is what? You do the step one to get to the step two. Okay, step two is the further audit procedures. Okay, and the further audit procedures include test of controls. Okay, further audit procedures include test of controls sometimes. And substantive procedures, and next to that, you can write always. 
Okay, so we always have to do step one. Step one is obtain an understanding of the entity in turn is including its internal control sufficient to um, assess the risk of material misstatement. Based on that assessment, we then go to our further audit procedures and we will sometimes test the internal controls depending on our assessment of the risk of material misstatement. And we will always do substantive procedures. Okay, now, Tests of controls are necessary when the auditor's risk assessment is based to some extent on the operating effectiveness of the internal controls, or if substantive procedures alone are deemed to be insufficient. And I want you to write next to that IT environment. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a second, but you take a look, and the reason I said sometimes is, look, they're telling us you do it when the auditor's risk assessment is based to some extent on the operating effectiveness internal control, or I guess you put the or here, substantive procedures alone are deemed insufficient. Now, we always do substantive procedures, and substantive procedures are designed to detect material misstatement. That's what we're here for. Remember, our opinion says, and you can flashcard that about substantive procedures. Remember, our opinion says what? The financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. So we're looking for material misstatement, and we have to do the substantive procedures to identify those material misstatements. Okay? Question. Are uh -huh. you doing, I have a question. Are you doing substantive and risk assessment I, I know you're doing risk assessment in the planning phase but you're also always doing substantive procedures in the planning phase no no we're talking we're calling this out in the um planning section here because it has to be in your written audit plan where you have to list what your assessments are and what your substantive what your tested controls where your further audit procedures, tested controls, your substantive procedures. Substantive procedures go on all the way to the end of the audit. I mean, getting a management rep letter is a substantive procedure. But you could develop an audit plan based only on risk assessment procedures. I don't know what that, I, I don't understand that question. Okay. Maybe. There's two, they're, they're talking about two kinds of procedures, risk assessment procedures and substantive procedures or tests of controls. Well. Okay, I, I'll tell you what, hang on. Let me finish marking up the book here. I'm gonna take you to a slide. And then if you're still having questions, ask me then, okay, hang on. Yeah, I just, I just forgot where I was in the audit. That's the only thing. Well, we're, we're still talking about planning and we're talking about that we have to have a written audit plan, okay? But what we're saying is the audit plan has these pieces in there, but you do these things at different stages of the audit, not necessarily in planning. Okay. Okay, but the reason they're talking about it here is they're saying, these, this is why I'm doing this, is they're giving you some... Um, they're giving you a thought process that you have to really, really, really understand, but they're giving it to you in the context of, well, this is what's in the audit plan. And I don't want you to, I don't want you to think of it as, oh, okay, this is just some shit you put in the audit plan. This is the way you think through the audit. That's the reason I'm doing it like this. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Um, now we come over and, and I, again, ask the question again after you look at my other little example. Um, now, they tell us that these tests, these substantive procedures, will include test of details and substantive analytical procedures. Now, what does that mean? Well, if this rectangle is my audit, uh, my substantive testing, Okay, what they're telling us is, look, you could fill up your substantive testing 
with test of details. That says test of details, e.g. confirmations. That says confirmations, guys. E.g. confirmations. You could do test of details, but you could also do some analytical procedures. Okay. So that's my, I'm going to put analytical procedures. I'll just call them Anna procedure, Anna Pro. Okay, analytical procedures. That's my analytical procedures. And the standards allow for analytical procedures for some accounts because there isn't the information available to do a test of details. For example, if I'm auditing a laundromat, there's not going to be, you know, a washing machine doesn't spit out a receipt that I can look at every time I'd be able to do a test of details. So I might have to do an analytical procedure if I was doing an audit of an entity that maybe is all cash and doesn't have a lot of things that I could uh, look at, okay? So go ahead and flashcard that we have to do substantive procedures and they could include test of details and substantive analytical procedures, okay? Now, I'm still not satisfied with the way this is all laid out. So what I did was I went ahead and I made a couple flashcards that lay out these uh, steps. And I don't know if I put it into slideshow mode, it's gonna take all my markings away. It is, and I don't want that. So let me just kind of end the show and I'm gonna have to show it to you this way, but I think you can see it okay. Okay, so notice, step one, risk assessment procedures, always gotta do them, always, right? This can also be called the obtaining and understanding phase. You see that in the literature as well, okay? So I come in here and I have bolded keywords, okay? And you have to obtain an understanding of internal control and environment sufficient to evaluate the design of the control and determine that the control has been implemented. Keywords, you have to evaluate the design and determine that the internal control has been implemented. You always have to do that. Based on that, you make a risk assessment. You assess the risk of material misstatement, RMM. Okay, you assess risk. You assess the risk of material misstatement. Now that D-I-A-R up there is my way of spelling dire. It would be dire if you forgot those keywords. Design, evaluate the design of the control see that it was implemented and make an assessment of what the assessment of the risk of material misstatement. Now, based on that assessment, okay, if you assess the risk of material misstatement at the maximum, do not test controls operating effectiveness and go directly to substantive testing. And I have a red arrow that's gonna go to the next slide. If it is less than the maximum, then you will test operating effectiveness and you're gonna follow the black arrow to the next slide. When we look at the next slide, okay, we now have step two, which we have called further audit procedures. We saw that in the book, but I'm also telling you that there are questions that we'll call it test of details phase, okay? Now, when we were over on that first slide, we said, hey, I assessed the risk of material misstatement at the maximum. I followed the red arrow, so I did what? I skip the substantive testing and I go, ah, God damn it. I skip the testing of the operating effectiveness of the controls and I go straight to my substantive testing, okay? If I've assessed the risk of material misstatement at less than the maximum, say moderate or low, then I'm going to follow the black arrow. I will first test the operating effectiveness of the controls, and then I will go to my substantive testing. Therefore, I say for substantive testing, we always do substantive testing. Okay, Kathy, you have a question. You want to follow up with a question now? I think that explained it. I was just 
since it was in the section that was called planning the audit, I got confused about whether or not you were doing a lot of substantive procedures in the planning phase. And it seems to me that maybe you might do a couple, but the primary emphasis is on the risk assessment procedures in the planning phase to help you identify how much and the nature, extent, and timing of the substantive procedures you have to do, correct? Well, even though we're describing this in steps, the reality is, and this is the way the, the logic works, the reality is firms are doing all of this at the same time. They're okay. obtaining the understanding. They're doing substantive, you know, they're all over the place, but that's not the way the exam thinks about it. The exam is not actually doing an audit. The exam is saying, do you understand the process? So if I went and I tested, the, I could test controls and do substantive testing at the same time. And if after I've done the tested controls, I decided I needed to do more substantive testing, let's say, then I would go ahead and I would have to do more substantive testing, or I could be obtaining an understanding and I can use some of that evidence to give me a uh, evidence to support the operating effectiveness of the control and a substantive set of evidence. So it's not like you have to go in these steps. And then the book is putting it here and that they're saying you have to have in your audit plan how you're going to achieve this. And so you have these sections in there that talk about this different work that you've done to achieve these objectives. Now, I wasn't going to do this initially, but I think it's probably worthwhile, okay, and to go ahead and um, let's see. Yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and do this, even though we're going to cover all this a little bit later um, in the uh, in the book. But I think I want to do this now. Do I want to do this now? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so. Um, Let's talk about the concept of audit risk right now, and then we'll talk about it again later because it is central to the exam and you're going to need to know it anyway. And I think the timing is better if we do it right now, okay? But we'll repeat it later, okay? But the concept of audit risk is the risk that we will give an incorrect opinion. What does that mean? It's the risk that we will give a unmodified, unqualified opinion when we actually should have what? Should have given a qualified opinion or should have given maybe an adverse opinion, right? Okay, so that's our audit risk. Now, auditors want their audit risk to be low, okay? No auditor wakes up in the morning and says, gee, I hope I screw up today. So you want what? You want a low audit risk. Now, you can call out your audit risk in terms of um, uh, a number, you can call it out in terms of an adjective here, low, okay, whatever, okay? Now, the audit risk is made up of the interaction between the risk of material misstatement and detection risk. The risk of material misstatement and detection risk. That interaction is what drives our audit risk. Risk of material misstatement is the risk that there'll be a material misstatement, Detection risk is the risk that our substantive procedure won't find the misstatement. So you've got a risk of material misstatement, and then you've got the chance that you won't catch that. That's going to lead you to the wrong opinion. Now, audit risk can never be zero. You always have some amount of audit risk, and I've selected a low number here, 0 0.05. Okay. Now, when you look at this example here, we also say that our inherent risk is made up of two things, our, our, our risk of material misstatement, our risk of material misstatement is made up of two things. It is made up of inherent risk and control risk. Inherent risk is a risk inherent in an account balance transaction that cannot be mitigated through, um, that, that is, is inherent, the auditor cannot control what the inherent risk is. For example, cash has a high inherent risk because what? People 
like to steal it. And once they get it out on the street, it's gone, right? So cash has a high inherent risk. Um, some items have lower inherent risk. For example, um, if we're talking about a building, building has a lower inherent risk because the chances that someone's going to steal the building in the middle of the night are not very high, right? Okay. So some accounts have more risk than others. That's called the inherent risk. Control risk is the risk that the entity's internal controls will not prevent or detect the error, okay? So let's just use an example here. Let's say I'm auditing a, um, a jewelry shop, okay? I'm auditing a jewelry shop, say a small jewelry shop, and I go in to audit that and I'm looking in its diamonds and rings, things that are probably pretty easy to fence and steal on the street and what and get and steal and then sell off in the street. So I'm thinking, yeah, jewelry shop, high inherent risk, and maybe the economy isn't doing too well. So I say the environment is not so great. And so I'm going to go ahead and put my inherent risk at the maximum. OK, if I put the inherent risk at the maximum, as you see here, I'm setting it. I can again, I can use a word or I can use a number. I'm setting it at 100 percent. I'm setting it at one. Now, I sit down and I talk to management. I say, tell me about your internal controls. I have to obtain an understanding of the controls. Right. That's what we said that in the risk assessment procedures, you have to obtain an understanding of the control. So I start talking to them and they say, well, what we do is um, we leave all the diamonds and rings out at night and uh, we keep light shining on them uh, so they look nice and shiny and at the end of the day we lock the door when we leave we're like that's it that's your internal control and they say yeah that's it we're like okay this company this jewelry shop has poor internal controls based on our, our understanding so what do we do we assess the control risk at the maximum. So we have assessed the RMM at the maximum in order to keep the what? Audit risk low, my mathematicians, we have to do what? We have to put the detection risk at low. We set it at 0.05, okay? In other words, we're gonna do substantive procedures that will keep our, um, detection risk low are substantive procedures. Why do we have them? Because they help us to detect material misstatement, don't they? So we turn the scope up high on our substantive test. Now, what does that mean? And from now on, guys, I want you to talk this way. I get students say, oh, do more substantive testing. That's not how we talk about it. When we are trying to lower our detection risk, the way we lower our detection risk through our substantive testing is through the nature, extent, and timing of our audit procedure. Nature, we're going to use the most effective procedure we can. For example, we would want to look at external evidence instead of internal evidence. External evidence is more reliable. Extent, we're going to take larger sample sizes for our testing because we want to make sure that we are detecting the misstatement because we don't have very good internal controls, right? Um, timing, we're going to do year end testing instead of interim testing. In other words, if you look at this little drawing of the cloud, the cloud is raining misstatements. And if I'm sitting here and I don't have a very good roof, which would be the internal control, the rain is going to do what? It's going to rain all over the financial statement. So what I do is I put my what? I put my substantive testing, that says ST for substantive testing, I put it at year end so I can squeegee all those mistakes that happen off of there and catch them by doing my substantive testing at year end, okay? So to reduce my um, detection risk, nature, I use external evidence, extent, larger sample sizes, timing, I'm gonna do year end testing. So I'm going to sit there and maybe for this jewelry shop, what I'll do, because they have such poor internal controls, <coughs> I say, I'm going to look at every single day's transactions. And you say, well, John, you'll be there forever. Well, it depends on the size of the business. Maybe it's a relatively small jewelry shop. You know, jewelry shops don't sell 
50,000 rings a day, they might sell one or two high priced items in a day. And so I could sit there and audit every single day's transaction to lower my detection risk, okay? So that's what this little teeter-totter thing is trying to show you to lower detection risk, substantive testing is ratcheted up. What do we mean by that? Nature using external evidence instead of internal evidence, extent larger sample sizes for my testing timing doing year end testing instead of uh, interim testing. So I go ahead, I finish that audit, right? Now I go down to the street and I go down the street to my next jewelry shop, say my CPA firm specializes in jewelry shops, okay? And now in this example, I'm still doing a jewelry shop, so I still say my inherent risk is high, it's still jewelry, right? But now I sit here and I say, okay, tell me about your internal control. And they say, well, here's what we do. In the morning, two staff have to arrive together. When those two staff arrive together, they are to take a complete inventory of all the jewels, all the inventory, all the rings and everything. And they have to each put in a number into the safe to open up the uh, safe to get everything out. They take a complete inventory of it. They sign off on it. There is dual custody of all inventory all day. In other words, there's always two people. Third person comes a little bit later in the day and they sit there and they, um, um, you know, we give the proper relief of breaks and whatnot, right? Okay, so there's always dual custody. And at the end of the day, we take another inventory of everything that is signed off on, on an inventory control sheet, and then everything goes back in the safe. And there are cameras that observe that whole set of activity. So we sit there and we say, okay, yeah, that's a pretty, uh, sounds like a pretty decent set of controls. So we're going to set our control risk at moderate. Well, now, because we think that the company has controls and we think the controls have potential for operating effectiveness, what are we going to do? We're going to have to test those controls for operating effectiveness. In the other case, we just went straight to the substantive testing. Now we're going to test the controls for operating effectiveness. So we'll sit there and we'll say, can we please see those inventory control sheets? And now we maybe will test 50 days worth of transactions and we'll look to see that there was sign off by the supervisor or whatever on those inventory control sheets. So now we're testing the operating effectiveness. Assuming that we see the signature on the inventory control sheets, now we can accept a higher, never say a high detection risk, but a higher detection risk. So now our detection risk has gone up, our substantive testing can come down, we see the little teeter-totter. And so nature, extent, timing, nature, maybe we can use internal evidence now instead of external. Extent, smaller sample sizes. We're only look at 50 days worth of transactions instead of um, every, uh, transaction, and we can do interim testing, assuming a year end, a 1231 year end, maybe we do most of our testing at 930. Now, even if you do interim testing at say 930, you still have to do something to make sure that things didn't go to hell in a handbasket between 930 and the end of the year. So you might pull a smaller sample or do an analytical procedure from 930 to 1231 just to make sure everything still looks okay. But most of your testing can be done at an interim date, which is great because we, you know, we'll probably be involved in other year end wrap up things at that time as well. So it'd be nice to get the bulk of our testing out of the way at 930. Now we can do this because what? Now we have a nice roof sitting over our, um, our, um, our financial statements. So they're blocking misstatements from hitting the financials. And uh, we're able to uh, basically alter the nature, extent, and timing of our substantive procedures using internal evidence, smaller sample sizes, and doing our testing at interim. Now, when we are obtaining the understanding, okay, we sit there mm -hmm. and we're going to do things like observe. And let's say we sit there and we observe and the what? The client um, tells us, 
uh, yeah, two people have dual custody. We say, wow, we really like the design. Because remember in the obtaining the understanding, we're looking at the design. So we're saying, oh, that sounds like a really good design. But we also have to, in the obtaining the understanding phase, look to see that the control was implemented. So mm -hmm. what we would do is a walkthrough. And when we do that walkthrough, we'd say, okay, show us how you do the controls. And let's say we get there early and one person comes in and says, hi, auditor, and does what? Puts both of the combinations and opens up the safe themselves. Well, that means that control was not what? Was not implemented. We then go back up and we say, okay, you know what? Our control risk is at the maximum because we were supposed to do what? We were supposed to look at the design. The design sounded good. And the first jewelry shop, we didn't even like the design, so that was enough. We have to look at the design and see if it's implemented. When we do our walkthrough, we would have realized if this, the one person came in, it wasn't implemented, we would go back and we'd say, okay, we're back now to the situation where the control is at the control risk is at the maximum. We won't test operating effectiveness. We'll go full to the full timing extent and nature of the substantive procedure. Question. Okay, good. All right. So the reason I go through that, guys, is because again, even though they are laying it out to us here, um, you know, as though it's just sections in the uh, audit program, you know, the audit plan, it is what? It is a thought process that we go through uh, when we're doing an audit and the CPA exam fully expects you to understand this thought process. Okay. Okay, good. Now, as um, I mentioned, you may have to do some substantive testing in the, um, if substantive procedures alone are deemed to be insufficient. And that is the case when we have um, a highly automated environment, okay? So we say, for example, for example, when computer processing used, documents may exist only briefly because they're discarded once the information is entered into the system. Worse yet, systems don't hold data forever. Data storage is expensive. And so uh, I was on an audit looking at the Federal Reserve Bank and uh, we were talking with them near the beginning of the audit saying, well, we'd like to get this information, that information. They said, hang on guys information is only stored in our system for seven days. And then we wipe the system and we start over with. Well, it's not because they're trying to you know, hide things. It's because they have so many transactions, Federal Reserve Banks, that they can't store all that data. So we had to basically plan around that. So in situations such as this, the auditor may need to schedule audit procedures to coincide. Uh, with the availability of information, or you may need to test the controls because you don't have sufficient documentation to support whatever you need to for a purely substantive approach. Okay, so that's what they're talking about there. All right, question. Okay, good. Now, going over to the next page now okay and from now on i don't want you to think of financial statements as a balance sheet income statement etc okay as numbers i want you to think of them as claims and assertions that are made by management so management asserts to you that if they list an asset on the balance sheet they're asserting to you that it exists they're asserting to you that they have included all liability financial statements. The financial statements are complete. Okay. It is critical to your success on the CPA exam that you know how to audit assertions. Okay. Because as we start to get into the various accounts and we'll start talking about this procedure for that account and this procedure for this account, you're going to start to say, you mean I have to sit here and memorize the procedures relevant to the accounts? And my answer to you is no. 
you need to know how to audit the financial statement assertions. So you need to be able to tease out, glean, uh, uh, glean is the word glean now. I know there's a word there that I can't think of it right now. There's a word that you need, there's a word there. You need to tease out, let's just stick with that word, whatever assertion is being asked in that question. If you know how to audit the assertion, then you'll be able to collect correctly select the audit procedures, okay? So you take a look and they tell us that uh, the assertions, there are six main assertions. And then they start calling out the categories that these assertions fall in. But for some strange reason, they wait to tell you the three categories. So I'm gonna go first and show you the categories and then I'll show you which assertions fall in one or more of these categories here. So we have transactions and events and related disclosures. And I want you to think of this as current years transactions. In other words, think of this as our journals. What's your favorite journal? Say the sales journal. That says sales, okay? So that's gonna be what? That's going to be our journals. That's our current year transactions, okay? Now, account balances and related disclosures, I want you to think of this as all years transactions. That says all years transactions, all years transactions. My pen's really dying, guys. All years transactions. And I want you to think of this as our ledgers. So let me ask you a question. If we bought a piece of equipment um, two years ago and the company still owns it, should it be included in the account balances in the ledgers? Right? Okay, it doesn't matter that we bought it two years ago, right? Okay, when we think of disclosures, okay, I want you to think of footnotes. As we're going through, we look at assertions that could relate to current year transactions, all year transactions, our journals, our ledgers, or our footnotes. Now, you come back to the assertions, and I guess they give you cover up as the mnemonic, okay, whatever. I don't care about this mnemonic, don't like it, okay? Um, so just flashcard the assertions, okay? And let's start with existence. Let's start with existence and occurrence, okay? Account balances, okay? And disclosures. Okay, so they're telling us here what category existence falls into. Okay, so existence, they're telling you if we put a something in the account balance, it really exists. If we're telling you that, you know, there is a red book somewhere, then we should be able to get some evidence that supports that they have a red book, whatever, right? Okay, now. The next one is completeness that I'm going to talk about here. And completeness goes to account balances, transactions, and disclosures. So it falls in all three categories. And think about that. Yeah, we want our account balances to have a complete set of data. We want our what? Um, actually, existence and occurrence also has transactions in there. Uh, so it also has all three. We want what? We want all of our transactions that happen to be included and we want all the proper disclosures to be included okay okay good when we deal with cutoff cutoff wants to make sure that a transaction has been recorded in the proper period so notice what we only call out transaction because that's dealing with the current years right okay when we look at valuation, allocation, and accuracy, it's all three categories because we want to make sure that things are included in the account balance or valued correctly. If we're talking about depreciation for the current year, we've allocated that value correctly across the various years. If we paid for something this year, we recorded it at an accurate amount. Okay. 
rights and obligations, and for some reason, they didn't write the categories, but we can write that in. That's what? That's going to be account balances. And disclosures. And disclosures. Good. Okay. So what? If we have a lien on an asset, say our accounts receivable, we pledged it somehow, um, and there's some sort of lien on it, or there's a lien on our inventory or our building, that needs to be what? That needs to be disclosed because we don't have the full rights to that particular item that's showing on the financial statements. Um, obligations. If we are somehow, you know, uh, obligated to, um, to cover the debt of somebody else, that needs to be what? That needs to be properly disclosed, right? And then understandability and classification, okay? And so really this gets more into the accounts and transactions and disclosures. So that covers all three categories. Where's my disclosures here? Okay, okay. Now, not only do you have to have flashcarded the assertions and know what they are more importantly you have to know how to audit them you have to know how to audit them so let's talk a little bit about that okay so let's say the company tells you they you see on the balance sheet building can you think of an audit procedure that you might want to do for the existence assertion of a building they're telling you there's a building there for a million dollars how would you see if it exists or not go see it go look at it so in that particular case what for existing the supporting documentation if you will is the building itself but notice we found the item on the financial statement and then we went and looked for it didn't we Okay. Okay. Good. Wouldn't now, you want to? Wouldn't you want to uh, look at the tax bill to make sure that they're actually on title for it? That's rights and obligations. Oh. Do they have the right to it? I would perhaps ask for some. Uh, what did you say? Some. I said property. the tax bill to see because I'll show you who's on title and if they paid for it and you know. Good. And it'll give That's, you an assessed value, which gives you some idea of the balance, if the balance sheet amounts right. That's valuation. I Sorry, I guess, huh? I guess I'm getting this confused. No, you're calling out different procedures for different assertions. And that's what you do. <laughs> an auditor does different procedures for different assertions. That's what we do. We go through and in our audit program, we list the assertion existence, and then we list the audit procedure. And to see that this building existed, we go and find it and look at it. What? What's the problem? Why are um, you looking at me funny? What's the problem? Oh. I didn't think I was looking at you funny. Sorry. Well, you started going like this, like, oh my God. So <laughs> well, you know what I, I was thinking? Here. What I was thinking about is if you have a large company that's got buildings everywhere, you're not going to go visit all their buildings. Uh, no, you would look at enough buildings to uh, satisfy yourself that you have sufficient evidence to support the existence assertion. Just okay. like you look at every single transaction but you would do enough work to satisfy yourself that those buildings exist. I mean, you mean to tell me that they're gonna tell you that they have a building somewhere and that's a material uh, effect on the financial statements and you're gonna sit there and look at property tax records? Or I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm learning this, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm helping you learn. No, yeah. you're gonna sit there and you're gonna say, I got to go look at some of this. I have to have some evidence that this thing really exists. I mean, if you don't, you know, imagine the, the devastating effect to the firm. If you go ahead and you issue the opinion, then it turns out that there was an empty hole 
where that <laughs> building was supposed to be. Okay. Or they gave you some funky bogus address or something for the building and falsified these other records and stuff. So under the existence assertion. And the key thing here for existence, I'm just going to put existence, write the word existence. We went from the financial statement, in this case, the balance sheet, to what? To the supporting documentation. So in order to support existence, you have to see something on the financial statement, go find the support for it. That's how you test the existence assertion. Okay. Now, how about a liability? Let's say I'm dealing with a liability. Okay. I want to make sure that the company recorded all the liabilities. Okay. So now what am I going to do? Now I'm going to go from supporting docs and then I'm going to do what? Go and see that that liability is properly recorded on the financial statement. So I see an invoice. I'm just making the number up here for $100,000. I'm going to do what? I'm going to say, okay, here's an invoice for $100,000. Was it properly recorded in the financial statements? Now, look, they're not going to list every single liability on the financial statement, so I'm probably going to have to look at some subsidiary records and see that those roll up to the financial statements. The key point here is that what? For completeness, you go the other way. You go from the supporting docs to the financial statements, okay? So when you see a question and they're saying, what should the auditor do? to make sure that all accounts receivable have been recorded, you need to understand, well, they're trying to tell me they want me to know how to audit the completeness assertion. And you're gonna look for the step that is what? Going to give you evidence that the financial statements are complete. You're going to select the one that says, select a sample of invoices and see that they have been properly recorded in the financial statements. If it's existence, they're going to say something like, look at the subsidiary ledger and the property records and tour the facility to see that that equipment is actually there or whatever. You're gonna go the other way, right? Now, which assertion do you think is harder to audit? Existence or completeness? Completeness. Completeness. Good. Completeness is the scary one. Completeness is the one that keeps us up at night because what? There's a whole world out there that should be on the financial statements and <laughs> I got to sit here and make sure it got into this little tiny document. Whereas what? With existence, okay, they wrote something down. I just got to go find it to see if it's there. And then Kathy, again, for different assertions, right? Different procedures, okay? For the valuation, maybe I'm looking at the property records for rights and obligations. I'm looking to see if they have title. I'm asking a about potentially any liens. I'm making them write down in the management representation letter that they have full rights to all of their assets. If they've guaranteed loans of others, they have, um, you know, loans guaranteed something for someone else, there's guarantees. They have gone ahead and, you know, disclosed that, etc. Question. Do auditors use uh, UCC filings and UCC searches and uh, credit reports to, to get at completeness? What are UCC reports? Oh, UCC search is basically a search uh, of whether or not somebody has a lien. Liens have to be filed with like the Secretary of State in the state that company's incorporated in. So I mean, that's something bankers use, but I was curious if, uh, if auditors use that. Well, I would think if there's some information that's publicly available like that, why not? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, really, again, the financial statements are the responsibility of management. And so we're expecting them to tell us, right? Yeah. If there are liens and whatnot. But then in support of that assertion, yeah, we might do something like that. Sure, why not? Okay. Okay, good. You know, the 
evidence that supports an assertion is a matter of auditor judgment. So, you know, I can't sit here and rattle off every single uh, audit procedure that might possibly be used because different auditors do different things, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, as we go through, we'll talk in different chapters about different procedures for different uh, account accounts and transactions. But I'm going to keep pushing you back towards what we're doing this for this particular. Um, that's how you think about financial statements. Okay, so I think that um, this is a good point to also look at this example that's part of our chapter two slides that I have for you. And this is sort of our little, um, I call this the sales matrix, okay? So again, we're looking at an account, sales, okay? Now, when you look at one account, you could get evidence to support one account by looking at another account because what happens when we have credit sales we debit accounts receivable we credit sales don't we so they go hand in hand so you might want to think about well what's the related account to sales i'm calling about accounts receivable here now you then think about the assertion and for this particular example now i'm auditing the existence assertion okay now what the auditor does and this is one of the few times accounts get to be creative they say to themselves what could go wrong? What is the potential misstatement? Okay. And as I think about that potential misstatement, I'm thinking about the inherent risk because we have to what? Assess that inherent risk, don't we? Okay. So I think about something called potential misstatement. And I just wrote in there, guys, and I know it's kind of small, so you might have to look a little closer. A sale and related receivable is recorded, but goods are not shipped sales account is not properly adjusted if there's a return. And then because I have to consider not only the, when I think of the inherent risk, I not only think about the susceptibility of the account to misstatement, I have to think about the environment. So the firm is in a competitive environment with marginal profit margins, okay? So I'm describing the potential misstatement in that assertion. They booked the sale, the goods were never shipped. There was a return, they didn't reverse the sale. So that sale did not exist, did not occur, okay? Now, I need to do what? I need to obtain an understanding, I need to assess the inherent risk, I need to assess the control risk. So I look at the control technique, the control procedure, and it says here the individual that completed the sales order and submitted the sales order follows up on the customer to confirm satisfaction of goods. I don't like that control. I sit here and I now make my assessment of risk. I have to assess my risk and material misstatement during the obtaining the understanding phase. That's the interaction of the IR and the CR. And I say the risk and material misstatement is high. This control is not effective. Um, this, uh, the, the, uh, this control is not effective. The design, I look at design and implementation. The design of the control is not sufficient to allow for a lower assessment of control rate risk. There is no separation between the preparation of the sales order and the control technique. The same person that made the order calls up, maybe that person is padding their sales because they want to get a commission and they're going to walk out the door as soon as they get enough commission, they're, they were messed up here, right? Further in walkthroughs, right? We do a walkthrough to do what? To see if the control was implemented. The control was not implemented because the staff was not familiar with the procedure. I've done walkthroughs before we're halfway through the walkthrough. I'm telling the person what they should be doing, okay? So that it would mean that that is not implemented, okay? Further, the operating environment of the firm is very competitive because again, I need to not only look at the uh, controls, but also the environment. So what happens? In my further audit procedure, in my testing phase, I bypass the testing of the operating effectiveness. I go straight to substantive procedures. I confirm all accounts receivable greater than 50,000. I'm doing what? I'm getting external evidence. I'm pulling a sample receivables from the financial. Well, I'm taking all the big ones and I'm gonna pull a sample and I'm pulling that from the subsidiary ledger and going and finding evidence, the person saying, yeah, I'm here and I owe 
$50,000 or whatever it is that they're saying. So now they're confirming what? That they actually exist, that they're out there. Okay. Now, the second uh, chunk of this thing is a different situation now. Again, still sales account receivable of these existence assertion, but uh, and still is the same potential misstatement, but now we've got a pretty good set of controls. What happens? It's a manager that follows up with the customer to document supposedly the, the, the customer thinks, oh boy, they really care if I like the thing they sold me, but really it's a control technique to make sure, hey, there really is somebody out there that received this stuff, right? And then they document that on a call log and then we have internal audit staff who periodically follow up with the clients and customers and say, uh, hey, did you, you know, didn't somebody else already call me? Yes, but we're calling again to see that you're satisfied, right? Good customer relations, but now it's the internal audit staff that are doing that. And then they enter their findings on a call log. So what happens? Now I say, hey, the risk of material misstatement is now low, okay? The control is effective, the design is effective, and then a manager follows up on a sales made by the staff and signs off on the call. Further, good separation of duties added because the internal audit department follows up on the call and signs off on the call log. The internal audit department reports directly to the board of directors. I want my internal audit department to report directly to the board of directors. In walkthrough, we observe calls being made by one manager who seemed to understand the process well, Further, we observe calls being made by the internal audit staff and actually participate in a few calls. Internal audit staff might let you do something like that because they're brethren auditors and they get what you're doing, right? So we're doing what? We're saying in our obtaining the understanding, we like the design, we like the implementation. Further, management and board director members we spoke to expressed concern about the competitive environment of the company and said that they believe that the controls were suitably designed. So the board of directors is involved, right? Okay, control environment is good. Okay, so what happens? Now we test the controls. We select a random sample of sales invoices for the year, vouch these to the sale call log maintained by the internal audit staff, and determine that the sales manager call was made by reviewing call logs for sign off. Da, 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 da. So we do a bunch of control testing, don't we, by looking at those documents? That's looking for operating effectiveness of the control. We test it, right? And then notice that my substantive testing has come down because I can accept a little higher detection risk, right? Is which is what we're addressing when we deal with our substantive testing. Now, in this example, which they are mutually exclusive examples, obviously, I just looked at occurrence. This table could, can, would continue for the other assertions, right? You wouldn't just sit there and do it for one assertion. Some assertions are more important than others. For example, existence is more important for an asset than is completeness. Completeness is more important than um, for a liability than it is for an asset, but you still would have to do some work around all six of the assertions. Okay, question. Okay, guys, that's the thought process that you have to go through with these uh, assertions. And the book does something similar to what I just showed you, but what I didn't like about their table and why I went ahead and did my own is they just talk about the potential misstatement and the audit procedure, but the audit procedure is a substantive procedure. Okay, so we have what? when we look meanwhile they left out the whole evaluation of the internal control that we just looked at okay so but let's just look at this a little bit existence assured assertion inventories included in the balance sheet physically exist something's on the balance sheet does it exist what is the potential misstatement the potential misstatement is that inventory is included on the balance sheet and it ain't there okay now what i don't like is the way they say physically exists examine inventory items, what I want you to put here is we will go from the financial statements to what? 
to the physical inventory. To the physical inventory. I, would, I can't spell. To the physical inventory. No, I'm not spelling that right. I don't feel like thinking about it. Okay, go from the financial statements to the physical inventory. Okay, now for the completeness assertion, inventory balances includes all inventory on hand. Potential misstatement is inventory items on hand are excluded from inventory. And then again, they kind of cop out. Okay, we would go. From physical inventory, thank you for spelling it for me, from physical inventory to what? To the financial statements, right? Okay, now again, what I don't like about this table is they left out the intervening evaluation of the internal control. So the potential misstatement, since I like football, you're gonna to have to sit here and listen to this example. The potential misstatement is the person trying to what? Trying to tackle the quarterback, right? The internal control is the guy doing what? Blocking that person from coming in and tackling the quarterback, the quarterback being the financial statements, right? And so you have to evaluate how good are the blockers. And as you evaluate the blockers, you evaluate them as to how talented they are at blocking that particular tackler. So you don't want a big 300 pound guy to sit there and block, you know, 100, you know, 180 pound guy who's a lot faster because that what guy's going to just run around the other, right? You don't want to sit there and have, you know, 180 pound guy block a 300 pound guy who's running it, right? So you try to match that control with the assertion. That's why I like that control when they were calling up because they were calling back out to the customer to see that that sale actually occurred, it actually existed. Okay, now, um, Kathy, a given audit procedure may provide uh, evidence for more than one assertion, okay? more than one procedure may be required, fully required to support an assertion. So again, it's going to be what? Probably a procedure, a different procedure, for different, different assertions. Okay. Okay, good. Take a look at written audit plan must be. Okay, so I mean, all the book was intending to do is tell you, it has to have a written audit plan and it, talks about assertions and all that, you know, and that's what they're trying to tell you, but there's a hell of a lot more to it than just that, right? It's really the whole thought process that we're going through. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this class question.
Professor, I accidentally answered question two in this one. So sorry for that. It's okay. I, Let's go ahead I and let's take it. Exit it out of it. So I, you won't be getting the answer for me. Okay. I won't kill you. Okay. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, this one and uh, poll and um, share the results. And okay, we got a pretty good uh, percentage, got it correct, 73%. But let's just go ahead and um, take a look at this particular question. So the key word here is what, or maybe phrase, I don't know, initial planning phase. Is that near the end of the audit or near the beginning, do you think? Beginning. Very, Very beginning, right? I mean, we're early, early on in the audit, okay? Now you sit here and you think, well, identify specific internal control activities that are likely to prevent fraud. We're sort of past initial planning at that point, right? We're really starting to get into um, obtaining an understanding of the control, which is not in the initial planning phase, okay? So that's not correct. Evaluate the reasonableness of clients' accounting estimates. We'll do that. Oh, yeah. But not in the initial planning phase. Okay. Discuss the timing of audit procedures with client management. Well, if we want to do an observation of inventory, say, during the midnight shift, do you think we're going to talk to management about that at the beginning of the audit or the end of the audit? Beginning or talk to them about the beginning of the audit. Look, don't show up at midnight, you're gonna get shot, okay? So you're gonna make sure, and they will help you with that. They'll say, okay, yeah, we'll make sure that you can get in and all those kinds of things, okay? Inquire of the attorney's client comes at the what? At the end of the audit, right? You start talking to the attorney, we'll talk more about that, okay? So again, what helped you with this question was realizing we're talking about initial planning. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at the next question. Lots of C's tonight. You know, sometimes they do that on purpose, what I, which I find annoying. They'll intentionally in a particular class have every answer be C and, uh, or B or something. And I find that annoying. Um, somebody's being cute when they do that. <laughs> Is every answer been C? Um, I think we may have one that may have been another one, but I think most of them were C. Yeah. I hate when they do that. Sometimes they do that. I basically um, I'm writing exam questions for the city and county of San Francisco. And um, it's always hard after you write all the questions to make sure that you disperse the choices. I like that. Accordingly, uh, you know, they don't have too many B's, C's, or D's. Because if I was on the exam and I had all those C's, I would definitely start second guessing, choosing more of them. We absolutely should second guess because the examiners, the CPA examiners, they uh, shuffle the answer so that it's one fourth, 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 one fourth. They, they, they will shuffle them. So if you're getting a lot of one letter, you might want to start thinking, uh, not yeah. that you should do it that way, but it, it could get scary if you're getting C all the time. Okay, guys, we're sitting here and we're talking about C being the right answer, and then somebody picks C. And I'm a little annoyed by that because now two people have picked C. Okay, come on, guys. Now pay attention to the discussion. Okay. Um, you should know 
that C is not the correct answer here because we're talking about developing an overall audit strategy. Okay, and so that means we're what near the beginning of the audit you don't develop the overall strategy at the end of the audit that would be ridiculous. And we just got done saying from the previous question that you inquire of the client's attorney at the end of the engagement didn't I just say that. Okay, so I'm not sure what's going on over there don't just pick answers just to pretend like you're paying attention to class here. Okay, now. Um, or does somebody want to explain why they thought it was C? I'm more, I'm all ears, but anyway, uh, the correct answer here is what most of us got it right. Uh, perform preliminary evaluations of materiality, audit risk, and internal audit. Makes sense because we're what? At the beginning of the audit. Whether the allowance for sampling risk exceeds the, uh, exceeds the achieved upper precision limit is nonsense. I mean, that's just nonsense. It's ridiculous. I mean, that's just words scrambled together to mess you up. I don't know what else to tell you. B, findings from some step tests performed at interim dates. Well, that's not at, the, um, you know, it, you might do that, but that's obviously not at the beginning. Okay, so again, my point from earlier, sometimes it's helpful to look, look to see, well, what phase of the audit are they talking about? And that helps present that helps push you towards the correct answer. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at You guys getting tired? You look tired, the ones that I can see. Everyone else is probably asleep. That's why they turned their camera off. Um, let's look at um, yeah, I want to finish this module five, okay, so that you got five modules that you can work through. So let's just look at this, okay? So we have what? We have our internal auditors, okay? And when planning the audit, the auditors should consider the extent of involvement of the client's internal auditors. Now, very important. Although the internal auditor must maintain objectivity and integrity, they are not independent of the client, their employer. Thus, use a different color. Thus, the independent external auditor, that's you, cannot share with the internal auditors any responsibility for any audit decisions, judgments, or assessments. Flashcard that. You're going to see questions that say, should the external auditor share? And ever since you were little, they've been telling you, oh, share, 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 you have to share. So you see a question that says share, and you go, of course we should share. No, you do not share judgments, okay? Now, what you need to do is evaluate the internal audit function though, okay? And when you evaluate that internal audit function, you are basically looking at the competence and objectivity of the uh, internal auditors. Okay, so flashcard that you're looking at the competence and objectivity. Okay, competence is reflected by education, professional certification if they're a CPA, right? Objectivity is reflected by organization level to which the internal auditor reports. And so remember in that little example of the sales chart I gave you, remember I was saying, hey, the internal auditors report where? Report directly to the board of directors. Isn't that how it's supposed to be structured? Okay. Okay, good. Now, basically, you will still, if you do ask the internal auditors to prepare schedules for you, you're not sharing judgments with them, but if you ask them to prepare schedules for you or um, help you to get documentation about the internal control, you still have to supervise and review any work that is done. And ultimately the external auditor bears responsibility for judgment calls, the financials, um, the reports on the financial statements, et cetera. Okay. Now you could also employ the use of a specialist. A specialist is a person who has expertise in a field other than auditing, okay? For example, 
I was on an engagement where uh, we were looking at the US Forest Service, okay? And you say, okay, they have their inventory and they have that listed on the balance sheet. And when you look at the inventory, what do you see? They say, oh, there are this many board feet of lumber in the forest. And you look and there's nothing but a forest there. Okay, how do I know how many board feet of lumber there are in the forest? So what we bring in is a specialist called a silviculturist who can go and look at the general health conditions, size of the trees and whatnot, and give you a uh, sense as to how many board feet of lumber would be contained in the forest. Now, when the auditor does that, they can use an independent specialist or they could use management specialists, okay? Now it'd be better if you had your own specialist, but the uh, reality is if you're in the middle of a forest somewhere, you may not have someone who's better at doing that than the very you know forest service specialist, or maybe what you're looking at is so special that the company is the only one that can have a specialist that would talk to you about that. So the auditing standards often allow for things like this, that you could use the um, specialist uh, that is on site, the uh, client specialist, okay? So again, you could use it for physical characteristics. Again, something like, uh, you know, the forest, how many board feet of lumber there are in the forest. Now, the auditor does need to have sufficient understanding of the specialist field of expertise to determine the nature, scope, and objective of the work of the specialist and evaluate the relevance and reliability and the adequacy of the specialist's work. You don't become the specialist, but you have to understand enough about what they're doing to evaluate their uh, work. Now, <clears throat> you come down and they tell us the auditor must be satisfied as to the professional competence and objectivity of the specialist, okay? So you can take a look here and they tell us that generally a specialist who is unrelated to the client will provide the auditor with a greater assurance and reliability, although the auditor should inquire regarding interest and relationships that may threat the objectivity. A specialist that is related to the client, specialist who is related to the client may be acceptable in some circumstances, but the auditor should perform additional procedures to look at the objectivity and integrity of that specialist. And we're going to look at some of those procedures here in a second, but I want you to flashcard because it might be a little counterintuitive. It is okay to use the client specialist, but you're going to have to do a little extra work, okay, to make sure you're satisfied with their objectivity, okay? Now, you come over. And if you are going to use your own specialist, okay, you need to basically reach an agreement with them, the scope of the work, their role, nature and timing of communication, and the need for the auditor specialist to observe confidentiality requirements. Flashcard that. That's something that you need to do when you are um, using your specialist, okay? And you come over and let's just take a look at what happens if you use management specialist. And then I'm going to look at the effect on the audit report. If you use management specialist, okay, and we said it's okay to do that, but you have to evaluate their competence, their objectivity, obtain an understanding of their work, and evaluate the appropriateness of the specialist's work, including data significant assumptions, methods. So you're going to have to look a little bit more closely if you're going to use the um, management specialist and flashcard that, okay? Now, effect on the report. If the specialist findings indicate that the financial statements are not in conformity with GAAP, what should you do, guys? Don't look at the book, look at me. If the specialist findings are that the financial statements are not in compliance with GAAP, what should you do? What? Don't use them? No. They gave me an answer that said entities' financial statements are not compliant with GAP. They said there's 50 million board feet of lumber. There's only 50,000. Talk to management. Know. Try to try to resolve it. And if not, then you might have to qualify the opinion. Yeah. Qualified or 
adverse opinion. Good, good full answer. But the ultimate effect on the report would be if it's not correct, it would be qualified or adverse. Okay, good. If there are unresolved differences between the um, auditor and the specialist findings, that's like a scope limitation. Mm -hmm. If it's a scope limitation, what should I do? Don't look at the book, look at me. What should I do? What do you do if you have a scope? I qualified opinion. Qualified or disclaimer, right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> taking a look, um, um, down here, where to go? Right here. Um, if the auditor is expressing an unmodified opinion, no reference should be made to the specialist. Okay, so flashcard that. So if you know you're sitting there and you have a qualified or adverse qualified or disclaimer. And you need to talk about the findings of the specialist to explain why you are, you know, basis for your qualified opinion, basis for your, um, you know, disclaimer or whatever, then yeah, call out the specialist. But if you give an unmodified, unqualified opinion, don't mention the specialist. You don't mention them. Okay, I'm flashcard that. Okay, good. Let's quickly look at, uh, can I do this quickly? Um, <clears throat> use of um, an IT auditor, because I want to finish this um, use of an IT auditor, because I want to finish this module. Okay, so let's just come over, guys. We might go a little bit over, but just hang in there with me. Okay, and let's look at the use of the IT auditor now. Um, down here. I don't want to get into the component thing. We already talked about this. We talked about when somebody audits components. Oh, maybe we're. Really? Okay, so we can just finish with this question. I'm not going to get into the components. I thought there was discussion. Of, did I miss something? What page am I on here? The There's only one there? page on the component auditor. Yeah, that's I don't care about that, though. Where happens yeah. to the IT auditor? Uh, that's page 39 to, to 40. Okay, so how did I get all the way over here? I think it went on auto scroll. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Now I see where I am. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay. Okay. Good. So let's just come over and let's take a look. I'm not going to worry about a component auditor, guys. We already um, looked at the discussion of component auditors when we talked about how it affects the report, and they add no new information there. So don't worry about that. Okay. I don't know why. I guess because they're talking about using the work of others. You have the component auditor. You have the group auditor. We talked about that already, and they didn't add anything new there. Okay, so let's just go ahead and use the IT auditor. Look at the use of IT auditor. And an IT auditor is someone possessing specialized knowledge in information technology. That's called an IT auditor, not a specialist. Okay, now you come over and um, take a look and they tell us IT auditors may be added to an engagement team in order to assess the internal control, address misstatements. IT auditors are considered a member of the uh, audit team, okay? Coming over and let's just go all the way down. And the audit partner supervises and reviews the work performed on the audit including the work performed by the IT auditors. So, I mean, this just becomes, starts to become like no duh stuff that they've said, it's part of the team. And the partner reviews their work, no kidding, okay? Now, using the work of a component auditor, um, all I wanna show you here is that the group auditor is responsible for the direction supervision of the component auditor, which we've already said. 
in another section. Okay. And then, as we've already said in chapter one, we said evaluate the adequacy of the component auditor's work. Okay. So, you know, not a whole lot of, you know, new information there, pretty much stuff you could have figured out self explanatory. So, with that, let's do this last question together so that we can get out of here. Okay. So, for which of the following judgments may an independent auditor share responsibility with the internal auditor? Can you share responsibility for any judgment decision? No. 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 That's a no, no. Sharing is not caring. You, that's right. You show, you see the word share and you think, oh, of course we should share. Where is it? No. Do not share. Okay, guys. All right. I think we made good progress tonight. I think we got a lot of extra stuff in there related to um, the assessment of risks and stuff that we will also cover in another lecture. So you should be in good shape to get through chapter, uh, excuse me, module five, and uh, we'll pick up with module six on Thursday. I have a question on one of the task-based simulations. It is uh, from module five. Um, and that is, they show an org chart where internal control uh, reports to the general counsel. Internal auditor. The internal, yeah, there, it, it's 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 assessing the objectivity of the internal auditor, and I always thought the internal auditor should report to the board of directors, and they have them reporting to the general counsel and board secretary, but they have the general counsel reporting to the CEO, and I mean, I guess one of my questions is, okay. If they're reporting to the board, they, they should be reporting to somebody the CEO can't just fire, right? Yeah, they should be reporting directly to the board of directors. Was were they saying that that was a problem in the question? They no, said, they said that they said that was the fact that it reported to general counsel was a indi indication that it was a they were objective. And I said, well, wait a second, that reporting line goes right to the CEO. Um, but I guess the fact that he was board secretary means that it's to the board of directors. I guess that's probably the nuance that I missed. And I guess that the thinking is that the board of directors isn't necessarily a group of people the CEO can fire, right? I guess that's I guess that's how that works. It's the other way around. Um, and I guess if he sits on the board of directors, maybe he's insulated somehow. I mean, the the look. I don't know what the hell they were talking about. Any organization I've ever been in, internal audit that I've ever looked at, internal auditors report to the audit committee. Yeah. You know, um, so it's, I'm highly doubtful that a CPA question is going to put something stupid like that in. I mean, they're going to report directly to the board of directors. Now, you, what you do see on org charts, sometimes you'll see a dotted line to the C. Uh, CEO, CFO, because administratively they have to report to somebody. Yeah, you know? right. But but their reports go directly to, to the, the board, board of directors and okay. it's the audit and the audit committee, of the board of directors. So okay. I don't know what that question is doing. That sounds like another one of those weird made up things that Becker put. Yeah, I, I think. Well, it said board secretary, and so I think, and and then, but they showed a line that went directly to the CEO, and so I think I I might have interpreted their graphic wrong, but uh, well, if there was a line that went to the CEO, you do see that, but usually they make that a dotted line because it's just it's trying trying to show you that that administratively they got to get paid. Yeah. No. 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 I understand. Yeah. 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 So from that so, standpoint, yeah, there would be connection, but in terms of their reports. It showed him reporting to general, it showed internal audit reporting to the general counsel, okay? But then it showed the general counsel reporting to the CEO. As I interpreted the graphic, maybe I interpreted the graphic wrong, because I would have thought if general counsel, general counsel kind of does report to the CEO, even though they may be a board member. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, council is supposed to be independent, 
you know, um, that's okay. why it was always funny when Trump would say, my attorney general, it's like, he's not your attorney general, he's the attorney general of the United States, you know, um, yeah. and so, um, you know, they're supposed to be independent, so maybe that's what the person was thinking, but, I, you know, the whoever wrote that question was thinking that, but I'm just like, generally, what I see is they go to the audit committee the board of directors. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's certainly the best if, form. If and that's I'm the taking the exam and they're yeah. asking me to do an, an org chart, uh, I'm, I'm pointing them to the board of directors. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was, I think, I think that was kind of a, maybe a mushy question. And I, I may have missed a nuance. So. Okay. But, okay. That was okay, my guys. question. Anything Thanks. else? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the recording, and then we will log off for tonight. Have a good rest of the week, and I will see you next week. Thank you. Okay, have a good night, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. You too.